Hi, everybody. Welcome. We're just going to give people a few more minutes to join in and then we'll get started. All righty, let's go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Um, my name is Shelby Sinclair, and on behalf of the co-conveners for the Haitians Book Club, Chelsea Steber and Brandon Bird, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our third virtual discussion in this series. Uh, today, we'll talk about sovereignty and the state. Um, before we introduce our illustrious guests, I wanted to first say a little bit more um, about your listening options for today's conversation, um, then the book club's mission, and then also take a moment to thank our partner organizations and sponsors. Um, first and foremost, our conversation today is being simultaneously translated into Haitian Creole by two wonderful translators, uh, Nadine Modestine and Nadej Shurubin. Um, thank you, Nadine and uh, Nadej. Uh, please remember, um, and this is a reminder for us, um, for our invited speakers and for all of you, um, be sure to speak slowly and clearly for our translators. Uh, if you would like to access today's conversation in Haitian Creole, please select inter the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen and then click Haitian Creole to join that channel. Uh, now a bit about the book club. Uh, the Haitians, A Decolonial History is Jean Casimir's landmark work of theory and history. Oh, one second. Yeah, Theory and History, published first in French in 2018 and in English, uh, translated by Laurent Dubois in 2020 with UNC Press. This book club is designed to bring together students and scholars, both inside and outside the academy, to a series of discussions with expert guests about the book and the major themes that Casimir addresses and reconceptualizes. Translation, slavery and freedom, sovereignty in the state, and colonialism and decoloniality. Our hope is that this forum will facilitate a robust discussion of a landmark book and provide a meeting space for people interested in exploring these themes in Africa and its diaspora across a range of geographic, disciplinary, and temporal contexts. To that end, uh, we really want to highlight the open dialogic nature of these discussions uh, and to encourage your participation. For those who are following live today, the chat function is open and we're ready to take your questions and comments. Um, for those of you who are joining us today on YouTube via the live stream, um, our comment box is open for you to ask questions or input comments there. Um, and if you're watching the recording right now, the comments section um, on our website remains open for discussion and ongoing engagement with the text and with one another. Um, for those who are new to the book club, please check out our companion website uh, and be sure to sign up for the email list. At any time during today's conversation, you should feel free to tweet using hashtag the Haitians Book Club um, and use that to share quotes from the text, um, any gems from our lovely speakers today, or thoughts that you're having about the discussion. Um, also, be sure to mark your calendars for our next session of the book club. Um, that's going to take place on Friday, November 12th, and we'll host a discussion of colonialism and decoloniality uh, with Marlene Dopp, Imam Batuvian. Um, this discussion will take place from noon to 2 p.m. Eastern time, which is a little different than today. Um, and you can connect using the same Zoom link as you did today. Finally, 
Thank you to the Haitian Studies Association, the African American Intellectual History Society, Vanderbilt University, the Catholic University of America, the Humanities Council, and the Department of African American Studies at Princeton University for their generous support of this series. Um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Professor Brandon Bird to introduce our guest for today. All right. Right, thanks so much, Shelby. I appreciate it. Uh, so yes, let's uh, let's get this thing going. Uh, let's introduce our guests, uh, who are uh, first uh, Chelsea L. Uh, Doctor Chelsea L. Uh, Kiblin is an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology at Dartmouth College. Say so recently tenured and promoted. So a big congrats are in order. Uh, in, at Dartmouth, she te writes and teaches about street politics insecurity and social performance in contemporary Haiti and the broader Caribbean. She is the author of Street Sovereigns, Young Men in the Makeshift Shape State in Urban Haiti, which was just published with Cornell University Press in 2020. Uh, and this is a really remarkable book, I should, uh, should say that. Uh, it analyze, uh, analyzes the potential and challenges of organizing politically in urban contexts characterized by poverty, insecurity, and government neglect. Her current project explores changing notions of citizenship, statehood, and the social contract through an ethnography of the global regulatory regime of criminal deportation as manifested between the United States and Haiti. All right, so welcome uh, to Chelsea. Next, uh, we have Dr. Natalie Frederick Pierre, who is an assistant professor of African diaspora uh, in the Department of History at Howard University. She earned her PhD in the history of the African diaspora with an emphasis on the Caribbean and Latin America from New York University. She's currently writing her first book, The Vessel of Independence Must Save Itself, Haitian State Formation, 1757 to 1815. Uh, and I should say, having heard uh, Natalie present uh, on uh, this work before, um, y'all are gonna want to uh, definitely pick this up. It's, it's coming and it's gonna be great. Uh, this uh, work will articulate the political thought of Haitian statesmen who were bound to preserve anti-slavery and create a government suitable for emancipated citizens of African origin in a revolutionary Atlantic world still reliant on enslaved labor. Previously, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the Graduate School of the City University of New York in the Institute for Research on the African Diaspora in the Americas and the Caribbean a Black Studies Dissertation Fellow at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and a Ronald E. McNair Scholar at Howard University. Public engagement is a critical part of her work. And after surviving the 2010 Haitian earthquake, she became the board chair of the Flamboyant Haitian Liter Literacy Project, an immigrant education advocacy group serving migrant Haitian teens and their families. Uh, so welcome, a big, big welcome and a big thank you uh, to both of our featured discussants here today. Excited for this conversation. Um, and with that, uh, Chelsea, I was going to throw it to you. Do, you. do you want me to throw it to you? You want? Yes, I'll take it. Okay. Cool. Chelsea, yeah, Chelsea, we, we, yes. We got, a, we got a big, big question right off the bat. So we're going to let uh, our other uh, co-convener, uh, Chelsea Stieber, uh, lead us off here. Thanks so much. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Shelby. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And especially thank you, Chelsea and Natalie. We're so happy to have you and grateful uh, for your time. So yeah, big, big first question. So why don't we just dive right in? Um, from what we've heard of your uh, introductions, questions of sovereignty and the state are central to your work, but in different ways and in different periods. So in the Haitians, Casimir demonstrates how Haitians, quote, reconstructed our sovereignty and the institutions that supported it. That's page four. He locates sovereignty within the Haitian people rather than the state, as we would conventionally understand the term. Indeed, he redefines the state as, quote, the collection of these rules for living together, the processes developed by two formations that began as strangers to one another, but cohabitated throughout the 19th century so that, so that they could know one another and develop a form of mutual recognition. End quote. And that's on page 380. So the big question, and please take us through your work and, and what you have sort of found in your research. 
Um, how do you each define or understand the state in your own work and also sovereignty? I can start if that is that. Please um, go ahead, Chelsea Hewlett. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, as um, you know, um, Chelsea, as that you are already mentioned, this is the central question animating in my book, uh, Street Sovereigns, Young Men in the Makeshift State in Urban Haiti. So what one of the things, one of the questions that I was asking really of my um, interlocutors or that they actually came to ask of me too was what is Leta for them? What is the state for them? How is it established? And how can it be redefined and remade in the contemporary era? Um, what motivated me really to write about sovereignty in the state was how the neighbor or organizations or BAS, BAS being the Haitian Creole term translated as base, but I think we wanna think about these as um, yeah, neighborhood social organizations. These were the organizations that I was working with and that I was writing about, that they referred to what they were doing as new feleta. We make the state, right? we create the state, we bring it into being. They saw themselves as organizing a polity that could not replace the state, not replace the government, but that could be a kind of micro state for the zone. And as a l'état local or l'état quartier, a local state, they could broker with governmental and non-governmental agencies to bring funds, resources, projects to the neighborhood. So much of what I write about is sort of thinking about the kind of state that Baz members wish to bring into being. One that responded to their need for protection, schooling, work, healthcare, et cetera, for all of those social services and very much seeing this as a social service oriented state. But then the hardships that they faced in making this happen in an age of neoliberal governments, neoliberal governance, right? In an age in which we see um, the functions of the state being retracted, right, by um, foreign influence, foreign aid, um, you know, as, as just as well as a, a general um, reluctance of um, the government to engage in a robust way. But also amid the struggles of organizing, I think this is really important too, the, the, the struggles that my um, interlocutors face with organizing in a context of poverty and rivalry. And I can talk a lot more about that, but a lot of the um, problems with new feleta had to do with multiple people trying to feleta um, in their zone, but also respective zones and the ways in which that created uh, internal struggles within the group as well as between groups. So I'll, I'll stop there and turn it over to, to Natalie to elaborate. Hello, everyone. So I approach the state in relationship to this argument that Haiti is a failed state. So I, I wanted to play around with this, top, with, this, with this concept from the origin of the Haitian nation state. But as I began to do my work, it became evident that there was no nation in Haiti before the formal political independence of the state. So I had to do two parallel lines of questioning. What is the nation? How is, it, how is it formed? And what is this new modern state that emerges during the age of revolutions? So the age of revolutions, there are two prongs. There's, a, there's, the, political, um, there's the political liberal revolution, this idea of individual liberties that's being promoted by the French empire. And there's the industrial revolution being spearheaded by the British empire. And we see in Haiti the, the, um, the combustion of both because the people who become the nation are adding some of the most lucrative commodities to the industrial revolution while at the same time being denied the political liberties advanced by the French empire. So that is, so that, that, that is a tension that I want to amplify in my work because when the Haitian nation state 
asserts itself, we have this um, we have this contradiction that Haitian statesmen must grapple with. So you have an industrial revolution which is um, amplifying ideas of free trade by people, um, and you have Haitian statesmen trying to insert this body of racialized Africans who just 10 years before they announced political independence were considered as part of the commodities freely circulating across the Atlantic. So in my work, I try to see this delicate balance that Haitian statesmen use to, um, to protect their political independence. And I'm very careful to not use the term sovereignty because sovereignty requires a level of international recognition at the state level that Haiti simply did not have. And Jean Casimir's work teaches us it was impossible to have. So this is how the state functions in my scholarship, but in my activism, I view the state as a generator of resources. And this is in direct relation to the work that I do with immigrant education advocacy groups. How do we look at the history of resistance from, um, from the rich cultural legacy of Haiti to make demands on the state, particularly in the US? So, I, so the state functions in two very different ways in the two prongs of my work as an activist and as a scholar. I'm gonna jump back in. Thank you both so much. I think my head was like <laughs> bouncing up and down in the little square because I was just like nodding and agreeing. I'm so excited about your work, Natalie. And I'm so, you know, it's great to hear the way that you're reframing this thinking and like what's, what's coming with the book. Um, I think something that you're, what you said about sovereignty really struck me. Um, and I think it, it connects uh, in, in really interesting ways to this modern or, you know, uh, contemporary work that um, Chelsea is doing. And also just some of my own thinking about why early statesmen write the way that they write and how they write and the, the question of sovereignty about the, the lack of recognition and the, and the need to um, make the argument and make the case continually um, in an un inhospitable sort of Atlantic world. But, but that's just sort of my own thinking that I've been doing more recently. I wanna, wanna get us back to sort of the questions that we've, we've um, prepared to ask you, but I hope maybe we can talk about that more in the Q&A. But so back to this question of the nation and, and sovereignty. So Casimir also argues that the nation um, or how he defines it, quote, the sovereign people in all its grandiose beauty, end quote, appeared in opposition to the colonial modern state. Um, and so uh, sort of maybe developing a little bit of this answer that you've already given us so beautifully, Natalie, can you tell us how you do or how we uh, can understand the relationship between these early Haitian governments in the plural, right, um, uh, and Haiti's rural majority? Um, that is the relationship between the sovereign people and the Haitian state or states um, in the early Civil War period, um, which were both attempting to assert their own sovereignty. Shelby? Yes, here we go. We're just bringing up a little bit of audio visual to help us think through this question. Um, here we go. Okay. <laughs>
Thank you, Shelby. So this song is called Pabli et Makaya by folk singer Jean-Steven Buinache. Hold on, let me move my multiple screens for a moment. So this album comes out in 1994 within the context of um, within the context of Jean Betin Aisti's return back to Haiti after the first coup d'etat. And as soon as I read this question, I immediately, the question about the sovereignty in, in, imbued within the people of Haiti itself, the song pops into my head um, because as Kazimi argues, the, the sovereign Haitian people are the ethnic African people who are the workers on the land and who use Haitian Creole to crystallize their sovereignty. So when we're listening to this song, the first question that should pop up into our head is who is Makaya, right? So Makaya was one of the African insurgents who resisted Jean-Jacques Dessalines in what Shrio calls the war within a war in the tail end of the Haitian revolution. So after Leclerc returns to the island and Casimir spends a great deal of time talking about people who defect away from Leclerc's army, Dessalines is one of these people who deflect, who defect, deflects. However, the African people who were in those armies never rejoined, never joined Leclerc's army against uh, um, Louverture. So you have this instance where you have Creole born um, Haitians, Dessalines perhaps, um, wh where we're still debating if he was born in Africa or if he was born in the Americas, but you have this tense moment where African born people are saying, no, there is absolutely no way we can join with this French Imperial Army. And Dessalines is sent by Louverture to um, pretty much subordinate what Casimir is calling the Guinea Haitians, right? So you have this song that emerges in 1994 that is telling people, Pablier Makaya, do not forget that the that the Guinea African they're not in collusion with imperialism. So that's 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 the first response to who Makaya is. The second thing is um, when we're looking at this name, this is clearly an African born. Uh, this is a clearly an African born person. Simply when we look at the etymology of the term. So ma is a suffix in um, Bantu languages that, that um, suggests that it, it's, it's, it's a suffix that means in relation to, whereas kaya in, in Bantu languages means tobacco in, and leaves. And I, I believe this is in Laurent Dubois' work. It's mentioned that Makaya was known for um, using tobacco often when he was documented being seen. So embedded within contemporary protest politics in Haiti, there is this allusion to the sovereign people who resisted, who we now see as the heroes of the Haitian revolution. And I think it's this internal, it's this internal resistance to what Casimir calls the emancipated Haitian, the French Haitian narration of sovereignty that we find embedded in Haitian Creole. And in order to see what it is that those people think about sovereignty, we must get into, um, we must begin with the Bosal, the people who are African born, the languages, the political philosophies that are in the languages. So ma kandal means, um, so kandal means uh, death shroud in those same Bantu languages. And everyone in this room remembers that Makandal was known for, for um, resisting through poison and helping the members of his community learn this type of resistance. So the names of the African people, the Guinea 
patients that Casimir talks about, it's embedded everywhere. And the last, and the last point I want to make about the, the sovereignty of the Guinea African is um, the, the second highest mountain peak in Haiti is called Peak Makaya. So the Guinea Haitian, it's embedded in plain sight. But when we take the, the nationalist narrative cultivated by the statesmen that I study, it's sublimated. However, you can still find it if you're looking at how the statesmen are writing. And we have documented evidence of Guinea Africans within early Haitian state documents. So even though my project highlights the Creole Haitians, the sublimated Guinea African pops up and I try to tease that out to highlight the sovereign Haitian people that Casimir uh, proposes, uh, the, the theoretical framework that Casimir proposes for us to follow as we move forward in the field of Haitian studies. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Nathalie, that's great. And that was so, so good. Uh, and I, Chelsea, if I can, I want to jump in with a question because uh, I'm seeing just such a rich conversation unfolding uh, between uh, what, what Natalie is saying and also what, uh, you know, Chelsea K is, uh, has also said and I think what also her, her work points to. So uh, Chelsea K, I want to, uh, uh, to try to, uh, in, in just thinking uh, along with, uh, with uh, Natalie and, and asking you a question now, I wonder if you could talk a bit about uh, how you see, uh, how, how you see uh, those young men that, uh, you know, that, that, that you have, uh, you know, worked so long with, uh, you know, lived alongside uh, in urban Haiti, how you see them thinking about uh, this relationship uh, you know, between their everyday struggles, both social and political, uh, not only in contemporary terms, but whether or whether and how you see them grappling, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, the, the ways in which, you know, ongoing struggles are part of a longer history. Like, uh, I guess, uh, I guess mm -hmm. the, the question here is how you uh, see just, again, trying to, uh, uh, to piggyback on Natalie a bit here, uh, how you see them maybe drawing links between past and present, uh, how you see them activating some of uh, past political struggles and ongoing political struggles, uh, you know, whether you see that as, as a phenomenon. Yeah, I mean, um, not to cut you off, <laughs> is, can I, is that, okay. Um, yeah, I would say definitely the first thing I would, um, you know, consider is how much has changed and how much has not. I mean, I think that um, Casimir lays out in detail the ways in which the um, settlements of the Laku, right, the extended family estate, and the Doko, the Maroon um, settlements, maintained a degree of independence from the state, while nonetheless relying on their leadership structures to broker relations and exchanges with state authorities. So when reading this, this text, I, I kept thinking about how these settlements resembled, but also differed from the Baas formation, the Baas formations that I have studied um, in Bel Air and Port-au-Prince really since 2008. Um, and what struck me was how the groups that I worked with were not primarily interested in the first, but rather the second part of the Laku Doko settlements relation to the state. That is um, that the Ba's desired to build partnerships with politicians and governmental agents, as well as with NGOs. Uh, very important to bring NGOs here into the conversation around what is the state today in Haiti. But they wanted to build these relationships in order to bring income and resources into their hands, as well as redistribute to the larger community. Uh, to the neighborhood, to the to the Baas as it refers to as the zone. Um, so as you know, the question suggests, I, I do think that this shift has to do with um, urbanization and the movement of localized leadership structures from the countryside to the city where the presence of the state 
or let's say of governance, again, NGOs too, is more pronounced um, in terms of policing the laws of the state as well as protests against the state's neglect. I think these shifts um, sort of demand of us to urbanize Casimir's insights so that way we, we may see, in, which are already urbanized, of course, but more, even more so, so that we may see not merely um, the differences between leadership formations in the countryside versus city, but also how the urban buzz is an outgrowth or at least related to its precursors in the countryside, as well as how buzz has counter influenced rural organizational structures in the current era. And we're seeing, uh, you know, the formation of Baz, um, you know, throughout, throughout the country now. And I'll talk also want to <laughs> keep thinking about the Baz versus gang gang um, as well and how that's shifting. Um, but I think if, I would say last, I want to um, sort of commend Casimir's attention to and this is, you know, it's uh, not really to hear you speak is so inspiring because I think we, we both appreciate the attention to the Creole terms used to articulate the domestic and political collectivities in Haiti. Um, you know, as an anthropologist, I am drawn to these, you know, we call emic or native terms and want to see them um, connected to etic or more general, some may say theoretical terms used in academic discussion like sovereignty and governance. But, and again, going back to Natalie's point from earlier, you know, why the, the importance of not using sovereignty, right? Because it's also important as Casimir shows for us to heed the actual word used and to appreciate all its complexity, right? And its ability to describe the local world as well as shed light on similar milieu or occurrences elsewhere. I mean, just think about just just you know thinking about it, considering how relevant is a word concept like Baz um, or even Doku for understanding the localized yet also globalized reach of many political movements occurring um, within and outside of Haiti today, like Black Lives Matter, for example. I think I will stop there. Yeah. That was great. Thank you, uh, uh, Natalie. I don't know if you wanted to. Uh, happen or respond in any way to that. I, I feel like there were lots of good connections perhaps. Oh, you're muted, I'm sorry. <laughs> After two years, I really I really shouldn't still be making this error. Um, yes, what, what, um, what I, I, I wanted to uh, add, so um, in the epistemology of the African diaspora framework, we are highly informed by anthropologists, right? So emic, what, what is it again, Chelsea? Emic and? E emic and edict, sorry. Yes. Emic um, and we historians, we call it categories of analysis versus categories of practice, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we can examine sovereignty as, uh, as an analytical category, or we can look at it as, as, excuse me, New York, hold on. I live on the same street as a hospital. Um, yes, so you have, a, you have the analytic category and you have the category of practice. And what Casimir does, um, I, I don't remember if it's in a decolonial history or in one of his other um, works, but he, he presents to us uh, not captive Africans, but self-sufficient settler, right? So in, the, in, in my previous question, there was a, what is it? Um, a rural majority. And my question about that, like what, 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 does the, what does the analytic category rural versus city mean in early 19th century Haiti or even now? So um, I, I think that, what I appreciate about Casimir's work is that he's providing me with the analytical categories based on categories of practice. So even though in my work, I rarely encounter ethnic African voices simply because of the nature of my sources and historians, we are archive fetishists. If it's not in the archive, it's not real, 
right? But we are learning because of the framework, we're able to read against the grain. And now that we have this theoretical framework, Laku, self-sufficient settler, Doko, we have all of these things and we can use them as a lens to look at the primary sources that we do have. So that's all I'd like to um, add to that. No, I, I think that was terrific. Um, I feel like over the course of the past few um, comments that both of you have offered us, there have been a lot of sort of connecting ideas and themes. Some of them are around language. I think the song that we listened to beautifully captured some of this, but I'm struck by, I'm really thinking about um, some of the strategies and methods and tools that Haitian people have used um, in order to uh, exist, exist in the Haitian state, so to speak. And so I actually wanted to think a little bit about chapter eight, um, which is entitled The Power and the Beauty of the Sovereign People. Um, in that chapter, Casimir discusses the precarity of one's status as a malere or an unfortunate suffer sufferer. Um, so this is a question for both of you. Um, I'm curious, what do you understand to be some of the most important strategies uh, the Haitians have used and are continuing to use um, to resist suffering, much of which stems from state policy, right? Um, or put differently, or to, to borrow uh, Casimir's language, how have Haitians attempted to seize relief from suffering? Um, what is the counterpower of the sufferers? Yeah. Whichever one. I think I'm with you. Kelsey, okay. Yeah, sure. I can go, yeah. Um, yeah, I would say, let me first start attention to Casimir's really provocative and beautiful phrasing. Uh, this, the quote, right, to seize relief from suffering and to do so by finding, accessing, and mobilizing the quote, counter power of the sufferers. I really see the answer to this question in the identification of this counterpower, this articulation of this counterpower. There are so many ways in which I have witnessed the marginalized in Haiti resist and recast their suffering into acts of redemption, revendication, right? Very important concept as well. Um, the way in which you will revindicate, right? Um, their, their fates. Um, and you know, I definitely saw this in the solidarities um, that emerge as family members and neighbors share cooking, cleaning, and childcare duties. In the yun et elote, the one helps another um, mantras that circulate among those who are often the least privileged to help but find a way to do so. And then of course, I saw this in the um, redefinition and re-mobilization re of suffering in the Ba's formations, which find a way forward despite all the challenges they face in organizing for their members' advancement and that of the neighborhood. They find a way to see the counterpower of the street. I think it's also really important, the counterpower of the street here, La Ri and taking to the street to bring projects and resources into their neighborhoods. So for me, I definitely see the Ba's and other forms of localized sovereignties as key to resisting um, the oppressive forces of national and global structures of power. But on a more everyday level, I also see the power of the counterpower, the power of the counterpower in the ways Ba's members, and really I think Haitian people more generally, can find the social energy and even joy or play Z in fighting for a better future. Um, uh, so much more, more to say about this. And of course there, you know, the, the Ba, I, I'm talking about the Ba's in this way that probably strikes many of you as like, ah, talking about the Ba's in, the, in a redemptive way. But, um, you know, there's, there is also, um, there is also the, the violence and the insecurity um, that are rooted in the Ba's that I, I can get to later, but I, I do want us to um, 
not go the way of the embassy and characterize um, the Baas as a, as a purely, um, as, as purely a source of, of violence. I'll turn it over to, to Natalie now. So um, <clears throat> Malewe is a term that uh, as a child, it, it really raised my hackles up. Um, so I, I, I'm an immigrant to these United States, working poor immigrant background. And when I encountered, uh, what is it? On page 271, Casimir shares the Haitian proverb, male fa mal. And I had this deep conversation with my mother about it, where she's pretty much articulating the epistemology of the Guinea Africans. So is this, it's misery is a constant in a colonial imperial state. How does the Malewe um, exist in that? Well, what Casimir tells us is that they have to creolize their thinking patterns in order to survive. However, that is not their only um, cosmology of the world. So in, in my research, I look at legislation in the same manner that Kate Ramsey does, right? So if you're looking at the French Haitians and the emancipated Haitians, so these are what we used to simply call Creoles. But again, Casimir is giving us very distinct um, uh, socio-cultural and political labels for these uh, factions in Haiti that existed at its birth and continue to wrangle with one another. So when we're thinking about the Guinea African, they're creolizing their um, understanding of the world in order to survive, but they're also challenging the economic logic of a colonial state. So instead of continuing to work on the plantations, and you see this steadily trying to control the labor of these people, but these people are, are um, resisting by going further and further into the further and further into the mountains. So in my work, I'm able to look at someone like Goma, for example, right? Um, what was his uh, Gaelic name again? I think Jean 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 Okay. Yes, yes. So um, what's interesting about a figure like Goma is we, we know both his uh, 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 French name, but we also know his African name. And again, Maureen Warner Lewis, who is my, uh, who helps me interpret the African ethnic presence in Haiti. She makes this argument that Goma in Bantu languages simply means leader. So you have someone like Goma, a Maroon, who, ex who is fighting with various French Haitians, emancipated Haitians, from the time of the revolution until, until one year before um, Christophe's suicide. So he is making strategic alliances while being um, a, um, the leader of self-sufficient settlers. So again, this is another Casimir concept that we can now use to examine the different types of political ideas. So we're going to have an alliance with the French Haitians, emancipated Haitians, but there is going to be a cultural autonomy. And the last point that I want to make here is in this, uh, in this argument, the sovereignty imbued within, invested in the Guinea Haitian, this is very, um, as soon as I began engaging with it, it reminds me of Partha Chatterjee's Nation and His Fragments, where he's making a similar argument, but for um, de de decolonization in the 20th century. And Casimir talks, he says that there are similarities, but because of changes to the world system, you can't easily uh, look at the theories coming out of the Indian decolonization movement in the 19th century. So in this way, for those of us who study, uh, no, for those of us who teach post-colonial studies, it's a nice companion piece. So Casimir is giving us 19th century, how people are maintaining um, cultural autonomy, resisting the colonial state. And you have Partha Chatterjee who's thinking about it 
from the late 19th century into the 20th century. So this text, um, yes, it's, it, it centers Haiti, but the practices of resisting the colonial state, when you put it in conversation with what's happening in the 20th century, we have frameworks that can help us see how people attempt to decolonize in an earlier and later period. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm very inspired by that possibility of putting Haitian autonomy in the early 19th century with Indian autonomy in the 20th, late 19th century. So I'll, I'll stop there. Let's, um, let's, let's, let's write something together about that because very much use so much of Partha Chatterjee's work in, in, in my book and just thinking about, um, yeah, that relationship, right? The inspirational way in which we can look to Haiti's past to see how people are organizing today. Yeah, very cool. Do y'all see something in, in your work on this, uh, th this fraught history between uh, the Haitian people and the Haitian state uh, uh, that is maybe not applicable, but is relevant to how we understand the state in the modern world writ large? Is, is there something there too? Absolutely, I, I, I absolutely. Um, I, th I think that uh, part of what inspired this project was a simple observation. We're saying that Haiti is a failed state. We're saying that it has a last name, poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere, and yet Christophe is able to build this massive uh, fortification uh, structure. How are you able to do that if you are isolated? You do, you, you do not have all of these materials um, in Haiti. So this, this let me know that, okay, if the idea that Haiti is isolated is false, perhaps the idea that Haiti is a failed state is false. And what I try to tease out in my work is how these various um, Haitian governments are grappling with the political philosophy of the time while also trying to preserve the um, anti-slavery within their borders. Unfortunately, they decide to commit to the agricultural mode of production, which ironically shackles an emancipated people to the emerging free trade that is um, birthing itself with the death of mercantilism. So if we, so the genesis of the, okay, I'm, I'm actually looking at Michelle Hector's book, Jeunesse de l'État Haïtien, which is, uh, which is a critical um, uh, part of my understanding. And I think Casimir is also featured in this text. I'm sorry? Okay, yes. So as um, my, my work, the, the, the French Revolution, the US Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, they are both, they are all three grappling. What is the best form of government for a post-colonial, um, post-imperial state? And rather than Haiti being a failed state, it becomes the template for political independence in the African diaspora. So though Haiti has political independence, it is never able to secure economic independence. And I think um, in the earlier stages of, of my work, I saw many parallels between the first sovereign black state and uh, the mo uh, one of the youngest uh, sovereign black states, South Africa. So you have your political independence, but you have no control over the economics of it, which is a critical part of nation state development. So if we look at the development of the state, of the black, of the racialized state, right? Because as I said earlier, political liberalism is at odds with the racialization of people who used to be property. So if we're looking at the development of the nation state from the early 19th century to a place like South Africa, to a place like Sudan, the newest, um, uh, independent black state in the African diaspora, we need to seriously interrogate whether 
the political projects imagined by Africans and their descendants is on the same discursive register as the, as the French and US state. And my research demonstrates, no, it's not the same thing uh, because citizens are not conceptualized as racialized beings with, with uh, the etch marks of slavery on their backs. But this is what the Haitian statesmen I'm dealing with need to propose, need to advance forward. And as Casimir says, um, uh, what does he say? He says, I do not believe this is a form of a nation state that is or could ever be suited to the interest of the conquered, the Guinea Haitian. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I am, ex I am so appreciative for this theoretical language to help me understand not only Haitian state development, but the tensions of racialized black states in the world system. And I, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, I mean, I just th thank you, <laughs> Natalie, for such an insightful commentary on that. And I really just want to second, second what you have said. Um, you know, I think when we use the, these terms like failed state um, that circulate in policy discussions that have right, real implications for um, global governance, um, take on this meaning, which we can sort of take for granted, but it's like, well, what, what do we even mean by a failed state? And for whom is it failing? And I think when we think about Haiti and many stakeholders within Haiti, the so-called failed state is actually working for some people, right? Um, which per perpetuate its existence as a quote unquote failed state. And I think what, um, what I'm trying to take from my conversations with um, these urban militant organizations who are advocating for the defense of their neighborhoods um, to see the ways in which they are saying, wait, how do we, how can we remake this failed state anew, right? In a way that it's not the failed state, which is actually serving, um, you know, in a, in elite and, and also foreign um, body of interest, how can we make it serve the um, general population more? And, and in particular with the groups I work with, with the urban poor, which is becoming, um, the majority in Haiti. I think that's, that's also really just important for us to think about the urbanization of um, the Haitian state at this moment and what that means. Um, but so much, um, yeah, so much to elaborate there, but I really think in using, in kind of trying to redefine and reorder the terminology that has been used to describe Haiti, we see the ways in which organizers are Re, 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 reconfiguring that terminology to say, well, wait, okay, how do we make this state anew, right? How do we reconfigure it in a way that um, serves us, the majority, and the, the racialized majority better, yeah. Thank you both so much. Um, we're, we're getting some questions in the chat. We'll give people a little bit more time to get those in and then we'll open it up. So just one last question. And it's a little bit, I don't wanna call it a geeky question, but I, I, it's for <laughs> Nathalie to, to really um, tell, tell us what she thinks about um, specifically, I mean, you, you mentioned Guinea, uh, Guinea Haitians and sort of the Bosal and, and the importance that Casimir, um, um, uh, how important this is to his framework. Um, and so I wondered if you could say a little bit more about Vate's writing um, and the way uh, Casimir is using um, Vate and maybe how you are using Vate in your work. Um, uh, so much of these ideas, I mean, I mean, we see uh, uh, Casimir um, emphasizing how uh, important it is that Vate was talking about the Bosal and the Guinea Haitians and all of that. So I wondered if you could say a little bit about how Vate features into your work as one of these state or, or state-related actors? Absolutely. So Vate is, in, as we all know in this um, forum, Vate, I think, uh, saw himself as culturally French before the Haitian Revolution. And this is what Malen does very beautifully in her work. The, gen the, the decade before uh, the revolution, 
Vate is in France writing beautiful flowery poetry. And then um, the Haitian Revolution happens and he makes this critique of Pétion. Pétion is an accidental Haitian, right? So I like reading Vate, well, no, it's, it's not that I like reading his work. His, his work is one of the um, cherished primary sources from this period, but part of the pleasure in reading Vate is his sauciness. Um, so calling Pétion an accidental Haitian, um, when he's critiquing the Republican mode of governance that the South adopts in, um, and they're not, he, he's critiquing them not because they're adopting the Republican form as articulated by the French Revolution, but as articulated in the US where the majority of black people are enslaved. He, he thinks it's utterly absurd. And he, and he says that, and, and I, I appreciate that sort of um, uh, subversive tickled humor that when you read Vate, it's always there. Um, how Casimir uses Vate, I think that, excuse me, I think that Vate is very clear that ethnic Africans, even at the time that he is writing, are not yet Haitian. They are becoming Haitian. And as a chief ideologue of, the, of, of Christophe's um, monarchy, part of his role is to announce what this new nation of Haitians is. So he's doing a lot of um, propaganda work to the outside world, but it is a direct reflection of the national, of the project of nationalizing that Christophe is trying to do in the North. So um, the way that this period was traditionally written about was Republican South embrace of laissez-faire, uh, capitalism, good, um, monarchy, uh, dictator, Christophe, bad. Um, how, 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 how can Christophe be a dictator when all Atlantic, uh, uh, um, Atlantic American states own enslaved uh, people? And, and these are the types of ironies that Vate is always pointing out. But now that we are living in what some scholars call late capitalism, I'm not uh, if it happened after 1850, I have no idea what's going on. But this idea that capitalism is not uh, this purported good that it's it was written as being when we discuss the Republican South. So it's not that Pétion was, you know, more, um, it's not that Pétion's Republic um, was more lenient, it's that they did not have the credibility to even attempt to nationalize the people in the way that Christophe did in his, um, in his uh, part of Haiti. So when we're looking at what Vate is writing to the foreign world, he is pretty much just writing down speeches, proclamations that Christophe is actively announcing um, in the North. He's telling these ethnic Africans what it means to be Haitian, because these people literally were not born in this country. They have a unique um, epistemology of the world that is very different from someone like Christophe. And if we're using the analytic category that uh, Casimir gives us, he is an example of an emancipated Haitian, but he's trying to tell them what Haiti is supposed to be. And you see um, the clashes within the legal structure of the country, um, of well, of both Hades. So let me see. Mm. Yes, so Vate is, again, Vate is very clear. These people are not yet Haitian, but by choosing a monarchy, he's, he is demonstrating his and Christophe's awareness that ethnic Africans are coming from African societies that are governed by similar political logics. This is the king. He is working in your favor. So the, the fact that they're trying to educate the masses on what it means to be Haitian, I think um, that's something we ought to know about. Uh, Christophe's uh, monarchy 
Um, and it's actually your colleague, um, Chelsea K. Uh, what is what is his name? Marvin, Marvin, um, Marvin Shoshot. He's also at Dartmouth. He shared with me. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. He shared with me Christophe's uh, Lancaster system of education model. This idea that you educate one group of students and then they educate the next group of students. So all of these ideas, these blueprints of how to nationalize ethnic Africans into Haitians were interrupted with the downfall of the monarchy. And it's Vate whose who's, um, commitment to uh, sharing with the world what Haitians were trying to do, um, he is my first access into that. And um, frankly, I, 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 he's a spicy writer and I appreciate that. Um, so uh, I, I'll stop, I'll stop there. This, uh, uh, this conversation about uh, Vete, uh, uh, it, it, it brings me, uh, it brings me back to a point, uh, uh, Natalie, that you made earlier about uh, some of the limitations that historians may impose upon ourselves of being bound to the archive. Because uh, it strikes me that, it will, I, uh, I should say it strikes me, but I'll, I'll pose a question like, um, methodologically or in terms of even how you approach you know history, how you approach your scholarly work. Are are you uh, are you also maybe not inspired, but you also uh, draw some uh, some lessons or influence from uh, Vate or uh, you know even Casimir in that regard too? Because basically, like wh where my mind is going is you know Vate will will, will write that you know he's spoken directly to uh, you know the victims of slavery that he's interrogating the the tombs and the ashes right. Uh, that he very much is somebody who is not bound by, you know, the things that can restrict uh, scholars, right, in ways that, that, you know, you've advocated for here. Okay, I'm sorry, my, my screens got a little bit jumbled. I, I think that um, in Vate's work, uh, so it's Vate's work that initially cued me to this analysis of Makak. So um, because of his uh, primary source interviews, he's able to capture um, the ways in which French Haitians, emancipated Haitians, people who are able to have some sort of social mobility in the colonial state were denigrated by their African origins and they encode that in the names. So the word makak in Haitian Creole means monkey. But again, when we're looking at the Central and West African roots of words, we find that makak is, uh, it, it, it comes from a Bantu language. And, and, this is one of the, and this is one of the things that you're able to do with uh, Vate's work. He demonstrates how Africa creolizes your Europe, if that makes, if that makes sense. So makak is a, is a central West African term. And then a 17th century taxonomist just picks up that word and brings, oh, I'm sorry, makak means monkey. Did I say that? But I, but I, but this group, you all know what that means. But, um, but he, he's able to, he's able to make those linkages to French uh, thinking because again, the decade prior, he saw himself as a member of, you know, the the culturally French uh, Haitians, and I think that, hmm. I don't think I'm answering this question very well, Brandon, but I think that Vate is doing translation work from two cultural streams. Um, and, I, and I think that that is a very powerful thing to do because as a, as a Haitian immigrant in the US, in the particular historical time period, so my family migrates during the Deshukas period and then we find, um, and then we have this concept of Haitian boat people, right? 
So the title of my forthcoming book is Vessel of Independence. So my question is, how do you go from being a vessel of independence to being boat people? And Vate's work helps me understand the slippages between the early 19th century, what people were trying to do, at least in the Northern Kingdom, um, which has, it, which is, well, when I started my work, was a very neglected aspect of early Haitian history. Um, and I'll stop there with that. Thank you both so much. Shelby, do you wanna uh, do a few of the questions? We've got a few now that have accumulated, so that's great. Yes, yes. So I wanted to actually turn it over to um, Willie Mack, if you're here and would, uh, like to unmute and pose your question. I, I think you had one for Professor Kiplin. Hi, yes, I'm here. Sorry, I, I uh, no can't worries. turn on my video today. Um, oh, hold on. Yeah, so my, my question is, um, in 1994, <clears throat> the U.S. invaded Haiti, and the U.S., along with the U.N., prioritized establishing a Haitian police force based on Western ideas of policing, i.e. what we see in you know United States today, urban surveillance, protecting private property and protecting the interests of the state. Uh, my question is, um, within this concept of policing, how have the, the Ba's engaged with policing in Haiti? Do they possess a policing wing? And if so, how does it work? Or do, do they resist or push back against US Western concepts of policing? Okay, you can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a very um, straightforward question and a very complicated answer. Um, I would certainly say that um, the Ba's from their inception um, and, you know, really dating to um, the um, democratic transition in Haiti from the fall of the dictatorship um, to the Aristide era, um, having a lot to do with um, reconfiguring policing um, and it making policing, um, putting policing really um, in the hands of the neighborhood. So one of the things that the Ba's really established its authority um, um, was through creating these um, nightly patrols, right, where they would um, bring together um, members of the Ba's, mainly young men, um, but some women as well, also older men as well, uh, to um, patrol the neighborhood or sit out front of um, housing to um, police who's coming in and who's um, coming out of the neighborhood. So that was very much um, a cornerstone of the making of the Ba's was this community-based policing. Um, but that was, you know, often in opposition to the um, police force that um, the UN, the international community was hoping to bring um, into, or attempting to bring into work in Haiti. So, that being seen um, as a different kind of force that, as you said, was um, concerned with protecting private property, um, with um, a, what to say, um, um, resisting protests among um, the um, urban poor and urban population, um, to um, you know other forms. I think of really kind of maintaining um, uh, the the existing class structure within Haiti. So, the sorts of policing that the Ba's was engaged with was more community patrols. Though there are a number of Ba's that um, you know even from the very beginning partnered with police agents and with the police force in order um, you know to create um, those types of alliances that I talked to earlier, where the Ba's really saw itself as bringing resources into the zone. Um, you know, in order to enact um, a state-like order. 
Um, I think today where we're at, I mean, this is a really, you know, really important question to ask today because where are we at with really the shift from Baz to Gang? You know, we're really seeing um, this, the vocabulary, but also the identity of what use, what we would kind of, I think, conventionally think of as Baz now as Gang and how that has really shifted um, and seeing the ways in which, um, you know, the um, leaders of, um, leaders of these gangs, like, barbecue and others, for example, have roots in the police. So um, I think that's a really important question for us to continue to think about is um, how these different security forces, the um, you know, community-based force, the state-based force um, have both um, resist resisted each other as well as interacted and dependent upon each other. Thank you. Chelsea, if, if I could ask a follow-up. Uh, so on this question of policing and also uh, with your much earlier uh, allusion to uh, uh, Black Lives Matter, I wonder how, how should we understand? So when we think, see things like, uh, you know, murals to George Floyd uh, in urban Haiti, uh, you know, yeah. how, how should we understand? Um, how should we understand that? How should we understand those origins, the, the meaning, the message uh, in those expressions of solidarity? Yeah, I mean, I think exactly, you know, as they present themselves to us in many ways of seeing, um, you know, the ways in which people are using, um, you know, song um, or music, art, uh, poetry, protest to really think about, you know, how, how do I critique the ways in which um, these institutions of um, power and policing have um, acted against us and thwarted our um, fl flourishing, right, in, in life. Um, now, I, I think it's, it's, it's complicated when I am talking about, okay, so the boss is engaged in um, a, a security mission to an extent of um, protecting the neighborhood and that taking on police-like qualities, but very much seeing themselves as quite different than um, the kind of policing to protect the um, class structure as it exists, right? That this being a radical, let's say, even revolutionary um, form of policing in which the, um, the impoverished urban resident would be able to um, protect themselves in their neighborhood and as well, as well as advocate for themselves in their neighborhood. I mean, I think that's really important. It's a uplifting mission, not a, um, in its ideal, not a, um, penalizing mission. So, um, but yeah, no, I mean, I think there's, there's a lot of, there's a, one of the things that I, it's like, you know, I always have these things in your kind of file cabinet that you want to return to, but, but the forms of, the, the, the ways in which when, you know, Black Lives Matter was um, taking foot here in the States, you know, the ways in which it very much became a global movement. Um, but the U.S., I think public didn't pay much attention to that, but the ways in which um, places like uh, you know Haiti and in the West Bank and um, elsewhere really drew on um, really drew on what Black Lives Matter was trying to say and do and continues to say and do in, in order to invigorate their own movements um, and that we really need to see this as I think um, you know certainly certainly not you know, deny the history of it being localized, right? And beginning in um, particular places, but the way in which it's expanded beyond that to really create a global movement against the kind, uh, uh, a global movement to um, destabilize and really eradicate the kind of policing that we're used to, to create a new form of, um, that would securitize, let's say. Um, yeah, the, the, the population, right? In all its complexity, yeah. Um, thank you so much for that answer, Professor Kivland. I was, you know, thinking and still meditating on the question that we posed to both of you earlier um, related to sort of the counterpower of the sufferers and thinking about um, community protection embedded in that, um, community care and support. And but something that uh, occurred to me was thinking about um, some of the ways that 
Um, Haitians have seized uh, or attempted to seize relief from suffering, as Casimir puts it, in terms of um, things that might be specific along lines of gender or using gender as a category of analysis. And so I, I wanted to pose this for both of you, um, thinking about um, some of these questions around um, uh, sort of resisting some of the sort of state imposed suffering, if there are ways that you see gender coming to play and how Haitians are navigating and making sense of state power in their day to day lives um, in, in different temporal contexts or um, or if not so much. Um, that's kind of a selfish question because I think a lot about um, Haitian women in my work, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, curious about how we see uh, women perhaps or um, gender being something that's uh, critical for us to understand or think about as we're, um, as we're making sense of how Haitians are coming into contact with the state or creating the state themselves. Thank you. Um, thank you for that question, Shelby. I'll, I can respond to it quicker because uh, gender is not an analytic category that I use a lot in my work. Um, but, what, but what I can say from the legislation that I've read from Dessalines government, they demonstrate an awareness of the, the, of the enslavement backgrounds of these new subject citizens. So there's this entire series of laws that's about um, uh, inheritance, the inheritance rights of children. So Desalines was in office for 34, 34 months. Much of this legislation, I call them legal fictions because they never had the opportunity to be implemented in the country. But when you see a law about um, inheritance rights, and th this, this is not a little law with one or two articles is very extensive. It talks about uh, children who are made fatherless due to the revolution, children whose fathers are French exiles, and in this very precise, and it makes, it, it makes us see a vulnerable category of people that are often erased in the early conversations about Haitians. So that's, um, so, so this is how women come into my work. Uh, so the, the next bit, um, how women come into my work is, uh, I argue that the Haitian revolution does not end until 1806 because slavery is still a challenge for um, Dessalines government, Christophe's government, because occupying, um, there are French forces occupying Santo Domingo and in the political imagination of Haitians, it's the entire island because Louverture had conquered, uh, um, I don't like this word conquer, but um, I'm exhausted, um, conquered uh, Santo Domingo in 1801. So in 1805, you have this French general who just rejects the victory of, 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 of the indigenous army as led by Dessalines. And he has what he issues what I am calling an enslavement proclamation. And it's a political record that neatly categorizes uh, um, people based on gender. So he pretty much says that if people in Santo Domingo in the borderland areas who were traditionally impoverished, if they capture Haitian people and enslave them, they will be compensated. But in that document, you see that um, uh, the, do the, the enslavement proclamation targets children. Okay, uh, they are interested in anyone who's older than 14, no, excuse me, any male that is older than 14 is immediately shot. Someone who's younger than 14 can either work on the island or be shipped off to, North, uh, to the Carolinas in exchange for rights. So we need to remember in the in Dessalines period, well, in the entire period of my work, you still have the Napoleonic Wars raging. And we must always remember that um, Napoleon was a fearful person during this time period. So Dessalines, uh, Dessalines army 
they are trying to combat this enslavement proclamation. And in the letter that comes with this enslavement proclamation, Sir uh, this general says, um, really, really ominously, will keep the girls who are above 14. Now, we need to recall what uh, Moe de Saint-Mary said about um, a Creole children who are not allowed to be children long enough. I, I'm, I can find that citation for you, but he's clearly alluding to Creole born, um, Creole born girls being used as sex workers. This is a time of war, but you really have to tease out um, gender analysis from these types of records. And this is how I've been, I've been able to amplify women and children in my work. Um, it's sparse, but it's what I have to work with. Yeah, that makes lots of sense. Um, I think uh, that is uh, connected to some of what was said earlier about the challenges with um, sort of a, the fetishization of the archive for historians in a way, I think finding Haitian women, finding Haitian girls um, at, in different points of Haitian history can be really challenging. I don't know if you wanted to jump in, Professor Kipland. Um, if not, we have another question from, um, from Stephanie as well. Um, why don't we, I, I could try and, why, why don't we take Stephanie's question and then I can try and respond to both. Yeah, is that? Yeah, Stephanie, if you feel comfortable unmuting and sharing your question, that'd be awesome. Sure, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, first of all, this is awesome. Um, and this is making my day. Um, and it's been awesome to have this companion while reading um, the Haitians. So thank you for all of this. Um, oh, sorry, AirPods flying out. Um, I was just struck um, by thinking about the Boz as sort of this counter, um, uh, this another parallel state structure to NGOs um, and um, thinking about, um, you know, the, the small neighborhood NGOs that also exist alongside the Boz. Um, and I'm curious about how you see those sort of working together. Um, and then I also was just, you know, every time as I'm reading Casimir, I'm thinking about these counterproduction, uh, counterplantation models, again, super focused on the rural. And as, you know, as Haiti's gotten so urban and the population has gotten so big, you know, how does that how does that change sort of models of economic resistance? And lastly, I guess, I'm just curious as all this, all this talk about rebuilding Haiti, Haiti has failed state. You know, it's said sort of before, like, you know, France, Canada and US gets to decide how to fix said state as their little project. But how do you do that when, you know, all of these persuasive models exist about um, a, a model that's so counter to these capitalist models and capitalist states um, that these other outside countries have in mind when they're even talking about statehood. So I'm curious about how your work um, for both of you has you thinking about the rhetoric of, of discussion around Haiti now. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'll take up a couple of, of for, uh, and bring me back if, I, if I'm not touching on all of your points. But um, I think one of the things that, um, you know, that I also want to think about is the how the Baas and particularly it's like governance mission being localized, how that, um, you know, certainly I think relates to longstanding models of um, what's what's to say, um, localized sovereignties like, like the LACU, for example. But I also think it has a lot to do with the NGO structure of governance and how, um, you know, NGOs have been both valorized and criticized uh, for their um, rootedness in a neighborhood, right? Or even on a block or even, you know, <laughs> within a couple, you know, just a, a corner of a block. So the ways in which it becomes so localized that you have all of these um, or a plethora, right, of initiatives that aren't well-coordinated, right? And are not reaching the nation as a whole. Um, and so I think um, we need to see that as both I think we, we need to see the the the, lo, the localization of the Ba's structure of governance as um, certainly advocating for the neighborhood, but also 
being um, positioning oneself in a way to partner with the NGO that is going to do their street corridor project or their, you know, pave, pave the, the, the corridors or do a free food distribution, you know, or a sort of small scale project. Um, it's, I think it's, you know, both the potential as well as the great limitations of um, the NGO model. Um, yeah, and I, I really struggle with that because I, I want to see um, the ways in which the Baza is advocating for the community, but I also want to um, be aware of that that um, can limit the scope of the public, right? And so it's 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 challenging in that way. See, and I'm already for, and there were a lot more questions too as well. Do you want to, um, <laughs> yeah. No, I was just curious because I think about like, you know, friends in Martisson uh, and Font de Marat who have their little, their little self-made NGOs and then they're the big foreign NGOs and then you have the Boz and I'm, I'm just, it's, it's just fascinating. And then the state's nowhere to be seen in conversation with all of those. So I'm just yeah. fascinated how, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really important. And I think we need to do as, as scholars and as, you know, just commentators on Haiti, I think we do a lot, we need to do a lot more to differentiate. Um, the um, kinds of organizations, because you're exactly right. I mean, so, you know, the, um, the Baz will refer to themselves as an organization social, organization local, but not an NGO. No, NGOs are part of the state, right? They're, or they're seen to, um, yes, we're recognizing that they're, they're different than the federal government, but nonetheless on, you know, the, the big NGOs, right? Like your, your USAID, um, your, um, you know, uh, Agence Francaise, there's so many ways in which you have these larger NGOs that that the um, you know people in Bel Air and your your impoverished neighborhood Cartier are going to see as um, those in power, right? As much as you would see the state in power. So um, I think it's it's. But then you also have a lot of diasporic, right, sponsored NGOs, which can be on the level of the boss in terms of their community relations. So. Yeah, there's a, I think we need to do, um, I, I hate to use the term civil society just because I see that as very much, you know, contested in Haiti, but I think we need to do a better job of mapping um, the different kinds of um, organizations that position themselves as, um, you know, social organizations in Haiti, yeah. Does anybody have a final question, final comments? No, I just wanted, can I just say something about just going back because I didn't really address the, the gender question at all. And this is something like Shelby, you've raised for me in the past and really want me to think about more, but to see, I, I do see one of the things I write about quite a lot is the masculinization of the boss and how it is um, a masculine form of, form of power. Um, that is being um, advocated and nurtured within the boss to the exclusion of, um, of women. But at the same time, um, you know, there are um, female dominated boss and, and that's become more of a um, phenomenon in, in Bel Air where I'm working, where you actually see um, the breakdown of one boss lead to one, one of the, one of the bosses with which I worked real closely, um, they sort of fragmented and uh, female dominated boss came out of came out of that. So um, I think it's just, um, I, I think when we see the ways in which um, the boss has sort of modeled itself on a localized state, we also can see the ways that that has been gendered masculine for the most part, um, though there is, um, there are ex exceptions to that. And I think there's a growing movement to create more um, female dominated urban organizations. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I think that's a really great note for us to wrap up on. Um, I think that over the course of uh, the discussions that we've had about the text so far, there have been so many really, really helpful insights for folks who are thinking through and with and alongside Haiti. And I, I can say that this conversation was no exception to that. 
Um, huge thank you um, to Professor Kivlin and Professor Pierre for spending time with us on a Friday and, and, and sharing more about their work and helping us to read Casimir better. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Merci um, you. Thank you. Oh, oui. um, so just a reminder that our fourth, um, our fourth convening, uh, virtual convening is taking place on November 12th and we'll meet at noon. Um, we're really, really excited for that conversation and encourage you to join us. Um, you are always free to engage with us on our companion website. Um, or via Twitter or however you see fit. We're here to answer your questions and help support as you continue reading the text. Thanks everyone for spending time with us and have an amazing weekend. Thanks so much. Bonsoir. Thank you. Merci, merci, merci. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks everyone. Mm -hmm.